gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for your word, for the time you've given us to come together and feast upon it. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is not of you, all of that ignorance and foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse. Uh, we have just begun to move into chapter 3. Uh, the second chapter ended with the amazing statement that we are not like most, the, the many, the majority, uh, who peddle the Word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God, so speak we in Christ. And I pointed out the more likely meaning of the verse is that uh, they are, in fact, inside the body of Christ. That there's a great temptation to dilute or to corrupt uh, or peddle uh, the Word of God uh, to increase profits. We, we recognize that we don't have anything to sell. We're ambassadors for Christ. Uh, I have not been called to proclaim what I've done or what I think that you must do. I, I have been called to proclaim nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Uh, we're not uh, ambassadors of ourselves. We are ambassadors for Christ and our witness, our testimony, our lives is Christ. The verse says, as of sincerity, the root of the word is sunshine. And it seems to me that that which differentiates the one who is sincerely proclaiming the Word of God from the one who's peddling uh, the Word of God is our being willing to submit ourselves to God, to yield ourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead. I don't think there's anything in the verse to indicate that those who peddle the Word of God may not in fact do some good. I'm absolutely positive that the Holy Spirit works in the presence of error. And it would be foolish to conclude that there is a, uh, a service someplace but, uh, but, uh, uh, where there's absolutely no error introduced by the mind of man, by the mind of the flesh. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit works in that situation. I'm persuaded uh, pretty heavily uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit has called His own uh, in services that are led by servants of the devil. We shouldn't be surprised. We are told in 1 Corinthians, don't be amazed for Satan to raise his messengers as ministers of the gospel of light. And so surely if you're going to look for uh, one of Satan's people, you know, you don't look in the darkest, you know, place on earth where people are already deluded and confused, but you look in the pulpit. There are also many Christians who know the Lord, who love the Lord, who will spend eternity in glory with the Lord, and yet who are making merchandise of the Word of God. So we went right into the third chapter where that we see what really, what really, really counts is the epistle of the Holy Spirit written on your heart and on mine. And I touched on that in the last video. You know, the interplay between those who, who teach and those who are taught, you know, the, the great evil that ought to concern you is not whether or not you work on Sunday, you know, but whether or not uh, the Word of God is taught properly, honestly, uh, openly, and that there's not deception in the things of the Spirit. I think God would infinitely rather have you deceived about what day the, the true Sabbath is rather than he would uh, he would about the truth of this book. True ministry is not based on how well we clean up the old man. We don't need uh, those kind of letters of recommendation. What really counts is what's written on the heart. I'm going to focus a lot on that. You look on the outward appearances. You know, that's all you can see. But God looks on the heart. And you, the text says, are an epistle written not by the pastor, but by the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, you're not written with ink, not 
but you know, but with the spirit of the living God, and as the Holy Spirit writes on my heart, so he writes on your heart, and what you and I can write with pen and ink is simply the appraisal of outward appearances. That's not important. And so we come to the paragraph that begins here at verse 4. Verse 4, I believe most pulpits today conclude that when it comes to effective ministry, that the end justifies the means. I'm not saying everyone, every pastor believes that, but, but you know, the end justifies the means, that souls are being saved, hearts are being touched, lives are being uh, led along in the Lord. Therefore, some of the techniques that are used are surely justified. Uh, now, it, I don't believe in that. The end justifies the means. I'm going to go down and, and I'm going to, you know, rob the first national bank of whatever of a million dollars and I'm going to give it to the the China Inland Mission. Uh, every penny of it, I'm not going to keep any, any of it for myself. If I go to jail, so what? If I can just get one soul in, in China, you know, saved, you know, I figure it might be worth, what, 10, 20 years in prison? You know, 10 years in prison for one soul. So that seems like a fairly good trade to me. You know, just take that million dollars and we now have a, we, we can buy a radio station. We can broadcast you know, to 100,000 souls or more uh, hearing the gospel every day. You know, surely 10 to 20 years in jail would be worth that even if I got caught. And you say, but Steve, robbing a bank is wrong. Robbing a bank is a crime. And, and I agree. I would have to agree with that. I, I have to, but I have to argue that deceitfulness when it comes to what and how we preach is a far worse crime than robbery or murder or anything else. Dearly beloved, I think that we should be much more concerned about what that kind of deceit uh, does, both to us and our listeners, God struck Uzzah, uh, Nadab, and Abihu dead, but he didn't strike David dead, who, who committed murder and adultery. So I don't see God moving against murder. I see, I, I see terrible things. I see, I see Peter saying, you know, Lord, let's build three altars, uh, one for you, Elijah and Moses, you know, because y'all are all equal, you know, you're all gods. You know, to me, that was terrible blasphemy. I can't imagine anybody out there listening to me saying that if I robbed a bank and I gave a million dollars to, to some big missionary organization that, that they, they couldn't do good with it. You know, boy, I, I think they would. You know, wouldn't one soul, folks, one soul be worth that effort? And if you and if you want to make it honorable, well, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go confess to the police. I did it. Now, boy, you can't hardly call me a criminal. I mean, they'll just put me in jail, and I'll be there for what ten, twenty years. I don't know, maybe more, or maybe not very long, given the times we're living. You know, and, and I'll be praising the Lord that I was instrumental in the redemption of, of 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 souls. You know, so it's my personal conclusion that the end does not justify the means. And I don't know of a better illustration to get that point across. God does not need me conniving in methods in order to get something done for him. It is the Holy Spirit in our text here who, who writes this epistle, the very one we're studying, in our hearts. It is not written on by tables of stone. That's law. And I see the following chapters addressing this crucial is, issue of law versus grace when it comes to the subject of ministry. We have many chapters of dealing with this subject, and it is a very exciting subject in my opinion. If you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 1, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Folks, the address of this epistle is not only to one distinct group at Corinth, but, but whatever groups that there were in Corinth, plus whatever, whatever groups that there were anyplace else. That's the way I read the, the address on this letter. I do not believe the Holy Spirit categorically condemned the paid ministry. I don't. I do believe that the Holy Spirit presented the position that Paul was in a much better position to resist temptation in diluting the Word of God or polluting the Word of God or peddling the Word of God, whatever word that you want to use, by mending tents. I think every man has to evaluate that position. It seems that Paul evaluated that position and said, it's better for me to mend tents. Now, obviously, it's the Spirit's work in the heart that counts. Obviously, folks. Okay? You can't read that without, without seeing that. Now, what's written by outward appearance is is not what the text is talking about okay now you may not pastor a fellowship but to some degree you are an ambassador for christ i pointed this out this is applies to every one of us you have to be very careful with that now i'm not trying to be critical if that's your opinion you know you've got to face the lord with it you don't stand or fall to me I want I want this held up to the light of the Word of God I have never asked anybody in this fellowship to agree with me in fact I've warned them that it could, I caution them you know often I caution you to to not just do that you know uh, I'd be it, I, I think it'd be I'd, I'd be kind of suspicious if you just simply said well I agree with you Steve and I, and, and I'm not trying to build a large following. You are counseled to study this book, same as me. And you're, you're entitled to your opinion. But dearly beloved, the Holy Spirit here is clearly said to be doing the writing. And what really counts in the way that the Lord works in your life and in the lives of others is what happens in the heart not what you can see on the outside. But let me tell you that most of my Christian friends, most of the Christians I've known, are desperately concerned about what they see on the outside. You have to, you have to make a commitment that they can see. If you don't make a commitment that, that, they, that they can see, then well, they're not sure you ever made a commitment at all. They're not sure whether you made a commitment or not. And there's all kinds of rules that man has devised to determine whether or not you are truly spiritual, quote unquote. You know, good Christians, they don't wear their mustache down to the bottom of their chin or I don't know. You, you pick one, okay? Okay. Uh, me, I hate shaving, so I mean that's that's about all there is to that. You stand or fall to the Lord. Now, if the church that you attend wants to institute a dress code, well, I believe they have every right to do that. But I question the superficial yieldness, you know, to touch not, taste not, handle not, all of which are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of, of men. Just what the Pharisees did. They taught for doctrine the commandment, the commandments of men. And the Holy Spirit tells us in Colossians, for those of you who remember when we went back, went verse by verse through Colossians, that these look good. These, these indeed have a show of wisdom and will worship and voluntary humility, but they have absolutely no value, no value uh, 
in satisfying the flesh. Christians today, folks, in the main, they want something that they can see. And it seems to me that the passage says that these are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. That's law. But in fleshly tables of the heart. The heart. The word manifest there is a present passive. So it, it would seem to me that it, it, what, it, what it indicates is that it's not something the subject does, but something that's done to the subject. That's what the passive voice means in the grammar. I am persuaded that the primary sense of the manifestation is the work in your heart. I don't do that. I don't write that in your heart. How do you know that you belong to Christ? Well, I think the only way that you can possibly know your relationship to God is in this book, in, is in His Word. By revelation, not by feelings, not by emotions or fears or, or anything else, not by, by individual acts, but by the Word of God. The reason a Christian is righteous, folks, is because of what Christ did. That is why you're righteous. This ministry believes that redemption is by grace, that we do not gain heaven by service. The, the truth of the matter, whether you want to believe it or not, is that you don't gain heaven by service and you don't lose heaven by lack of service. You know, if you're going to glory, well, you're going to glory because Jesus Christ died in your place. You know, there are many pastors who wouldn't dare. I mean, they wouldn't even think of telling you that you go to heaven by works or that you go to heaven by service. And yet, many of them infer that in the very message that they teach, in the very thing that the message that... that they believe is correct, you know, it, that heaven is your choice, that life and service is your choice. And I, I have to come to the conclusion that the many who corrupt the Word of God here in this passage are, are those out of the body of the redeemed. It's not talking about non-believers. You know, it may not be your view, but that's the view I hold. And so... Most of them are making merchandise of the Word of God. I think that's the subject of the passage that that even though we know, I, folks, look, listen, we know, we know that Satan's messengers are in the pulpit. We also know that most Christians are making merchandise of the Word of God. What really ought to concern us is what the Holy Spirit's doing in the heart. The heart. You know, think of that the next time that you meet a Christian, you know, whose language is, is just terrible. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, Pastor, I just can't imagine why that guy comes to church. Well, you know, maybe you should have heard his language before he was redeemed. You know, Christians seem to find it so easy to pass judgment on somebody. You know, based, uh, based on what they hear him say or on what they see him do or not do, when folks, they can't see his heart. Dearly beloved, I don't have any right to look upon your, on the outward appearance. Okay? You do not stand or fall to me. You stand or fall to the Lord. Uh, verse 2, uh, we, we, we read that you are our epistle, having been written, with, that is a perfect tense, that's with the result, it was written with the result that you stand perfectly written for all eternity 
in our, in your, in our hearts. Known and read of all men. And I believe that all men means, well, just means just what it means. All men. Uh, that's that's a, a, a little tough, that verse. You got to kind of wrangle through that. The all men part. You know, the text says, known and read by all men. Well, what does that mean? All men. I do not believe Christ died in the place of the ungodly, as, as many Christians do. His death for us in our place was substitutionary. However, the word does say that he is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. And if, and if folks, if you don't understand what deliverance is, the difference between redemption and deliverance, then, then you've got a little bit of a problem. If you say that there's a verse that says, well, Christ died for all, th then I have to say that all are going to heaven. If he, if, he, if he died in the place of all, then all have to go to heaven. Okay, they just have to. And I can't say that. I do not believe that Jesus Christ died in every man's place. I do believe that Jesus Christ removed Adam's transgression. That's what the text says in Romans. We, we saw that when we studied through Romans. He removed Adam's transgression for every man. That's why he's the deliverer of all men. He delivered every man from Adam's transgression. He particularly delivered those who believe. So I'm saying that the epistles of Christ, written not with ink, but in the heart, by the Spirit of, of the living God is something that I know every day. I don't know whether you do or not. I trust you do. I can't look on your heart. I can't judge that. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that it's my right to count subscribers. It's not my right to count sheep. I am certain that many hundreds of years ago, I would have probably, I'd have probably counted Saul of Tarsus, the servant of the devil. I'm pretty sure of that. And I would have thought that the greatest thing that could happen to the Christian community is the death of Saul. Of course, I'd have been wrong. You know, because the truth is that God had separated him from his mother's womb and, and called him by his grace to reveal his son in him. I, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that before. But I do know that now. I do know that now. I hope you're getting the point here. All I'm suggesting is that the present passage is a constant activity of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And I'm simply suggesting to you, I believe that's my heart and Paul's heart and your heart. It's the Holy Spirit that seals truth to your heart and mine. And I'm simply suggesting that our present passage here is referring to the work of of the Holy Spirit, not my work, not your work, not anybody else's work, and it's something that's constantly there. Constantly there. As it was in the, the case of Paul, you know, where I, well, I would have wanted to stone him. I mean, you know, I, I don't think Stephen Sewell is known and read of all men yet okay but i believe he will be i think that that will be manifestly declared but even now you're reading my heart and i'm reading your heart i would prefer to say the holy spirit is writing in your heart through me and the holy spirit is writing in my heart through you But I do not believe, I, do, I don't believe that's known and read of all men yet. Or you could take another, the other position that many take, and that is that the all men could mean everybody at Corinth. That's many take that position. 
known and read. You know, the read is a perfect passive. The known is a present passive. So uh, maybe the all men there is the all at Corinth. I don't know. I'll leave that up to you to decide. And that leads directly into the fourth verse. I'm going to try to quickly go through this chapter. I hope I don't blow through it too fast. Uh, but you can pause, play back, whatever. And such trust have we through Christ toward God. Now, trust is the word pastuo. Uh, there uh, is in your translation, I mean, the, you know, faith. But the word trust there comes from the root python. Persuade is the word. Python's an interesting word. You see it in Hebrews uh, chapter 13. You know, obey them who have the rule over you and submit yourselves to them. Uh, you know, and, you know, if you're in a strict congregation, of course, that's, that's a really super verse. I'm not suggesting, folks, that you should disobey or that there should not be people in authority. I'm not suggesting that at all. I believe God has ordained an ecclesi ecclesiastical order. There, there should be order in the church. Uh, I believe you've been ordained to submit yourselves to the elders of the fellowship. Uh, I believe that the older men, you know, should take the oversight. I've always believed that. I believe in all of that. But I don't, I don't like translating python as obey which the authorized version says i believe hebrews chapter 13 says be persuaded by the leadership of the fellowship and if you're not persuaded by the leadership in a certain fellowship then i i i would suggest you go find go find another one where that you are persuaded by that leadership that surely makes perfect sense If all of the older men of this fellowship were practicing, uh, you know, counterfeiters and, and robbers and criminals and crooks, I don't think I would, you know, I, would, I wouldn't be too well persuaded. I believe you should go to a fellowship where that you are comfortable, where that you are persuaded by the leadership, and that's the word python, persuade, okay? Now, such persuasion have we through Christ. This is where it really gets good. Such persuasion have we through Christ toward the God. It's articulated. We could translate it confidence. Uh, the word is persuasion. But such confidence or persuasion have we by means of Christ. And the word is dia. Uh, the word can mean through. Uh, it can often mean because of. I'm, I'm reading it as because of or by means of Christ. And yet what I see, it seems to me that many Christians that I meet have supreme confidence in the flesh. Uh, confidence because of the way that they live. They, therefore, they, they have a lot of confidence. And I believe this is a disastrous error that has come out of uh, much of so-called evangelical preaching. You know, that we presented Christianity in such a way that people can say, just as the, the rich young ruler did, you know, uh, all of these have I kept from my youth up. The verse says, such confidence have we because of Christ our confidence is Christ. It's amazing how that it is so simple that our focus is to be on Christ and not ourself. 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, I, I read that, that whether you're faithful or unfaithful, you'll live together with Him be, because of Christ. Why am I going to live with God? Because of Christ. Why am I going to go to heaven? Because of Christ. Why am I a new creation? Because of Christ. Why am I uh, anything that I am? Because of Christ. 
Why am I clothed with the righteousness of God? Because of Christ. You know, oh, but, but says the human mind, uh, if there's no life attached to that, then it can't be true. You know, kind of like Paul on a, before his road, his conversion on the road to Damascus. So I, I say to you then, well, God did it all. You know, uh, but it wasn't by merit. We see the same thing in Noah. God looked down and saw that man's thought was only evil continually, but Noah, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Why did he find grace? Well, because he, he was absolutely disturbed about all of the, the garbage that was going on around him, and, and he prayed faithfully to the Lord. He was, a, he was this little candle in a dark world, and, and God said, you know, saw, looked down, saw that, and said, Oh, good for Noah, man. I, and I'll reward that. Well, that's not grace. If that's what happened, folks, then the word should say Noah found merit in the eyes of the Lord. doesn't say that. God looked down, dearly beloved, and saw that Noah's thought was only evil continually, that everything he did was wrong, that Noah was totally depraved, totally evil, and God showered grace on Noah. Now that's grace. And as much as I say that, well, I'm persuaded from what I read and what I hear and the Christians that I talk to, the Christians, all the Christians I've known my whole life, you know, they're unwilling to simply take God at His word. No, 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 no. I, I realize I realize it's because of Christ, but there must be, there's got to be prayer. There's got to be service. There's got to be worship. There's got to be tithing. There's got to be this. There's got to be that. There's got to be a change in the life. There's just got to be. There's got to be. Folks, that's merit. And if it's merit, it's pagan Christianity. And Christianity is not merit. And it's not pagan. It's grace. Abraham was not seeking God, folks. I'm told in Romans 4, Abraham was not serving God. Abraham was God's enemy. More than that, he was hostile to God. And God showered grace on him one who was not seeking God, one who was not working for God, one who was not believing God, one who was not trusting God, one who was in fact hostile and who was an enemy of God. It was to that one that God showered grace. Same was true of you and me. And such confidence have we with such persuasion is because of Christ. Dearly beloved, God does not need our help. You know, us will, will gladly testify to that. You know, you may want to please God, and I, and I thank God for that. I truly do, folks, I do. But that pleasing Him has to be based upon the fact that God says that He's accepted you in Christ. You have been accepted in the Beloved. That's Christ. You stand before Him holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. You stand before Him in love, clothed in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. He, <coughs> excuse me, I do not believe that God is going to pat you on the head someday and say, you know, oh, I know you didn't do very good, but boy, you tried once in a while. You know, oftentimes I tried to please my dad when I was young. My heart was in the right place. I, I believe it was. I, I, I just wanted to help my dad, but my abilities were, were really not up to par. He was having trouble with his old car one day, and he came home, and half the engine was all over the garage. And I said, well, Dad, I just decided to help you out here a little bit. So I took it apart, and he said, well, well, well how do we put it back together? 
I don't think he wanted to uh, to shatter my confidence in in, in my father, uh, who you know was next to a genius in my eyes. He told me that he could take things apart and put them back together because he took them apart. I was in a little bit of a tr a little little bit of a, a trouble there. We got it back together, but man, we had a we had we had we didn't we had I think we had uh, parts left over all over the place. But by some miracle, the car ran. But some parts laid around the, the, the garage for years. Somehow or other, we seem to have the idea that God's going to appreciate the fact that we tried. The world says, walk so that you'll be. God says, walk because you are. It's really that simple, folks, and that is what is so amazing. God our Father determined in all wisdom, all the wisdom that He had, that His children grow up by positive reinforcement, not by taking you to the woodshed. Now, and, and I don't know why any Christian would not like that. Not by law, but by grace. The problem is that the devil stepped his big foot into that word grace right from the start, or that most Christians today think grace is something that God, God's people earn. It's amazing how they've convinced them of that. You know, they may not, they may not come right out and admit that, but but they've watered down its meaning. You know, a guy emailed me here not too long ago, you know, and he said, you know, you have to admit, Steve, that there's, there's a great difference between the person who tries to obey the law and one who doesn't. And I said, I don't see that difference in the Word of God at all. You know, there may be a difference in the eyes of, of the, the state of Oklahoma, you know, the judge in the court of Oklahoma may say, well, you know, at least the guy tried, you know. I don't think God suggests in any place in His Word that there is merit for trying. He that is guilty, folks, in one, if you're guilty in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. The law kills it is the spirit that makes alive why do i have confidence before god because of christ not because i try not because i did anything but i have great confidence because of the finished work of jesus christ and our verse says our verse says we have we have that confidence toward the God. In fact, the verse says, And such supreme confidence have we by means of the Christ toward the God. And the definition is clear that this is my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ before the living God of, of creation. My confidence is in Christ. Not my obedience, not my talents, not my efforts, not my how smart I am or, or anything else. Not my surrender, not my belief, but the not even my faith. The confidence that I have is because of Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for, for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now, when we get down to verse 5, I want you to notice here that the word glory, take a highlighter. If you, The word glory appears 13 times, or 14 times, I think. 14 times, yeah, in the next 12 verses. So I, I, th I reckon we ought to pay close attention, especially to the word glory. And this is where it really gets good. I love this, okay? Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as coming out of, the word is ek in the Greek, out of ourselves, but our sufficiency is ek, out of God. Verse 6, who also hath made us able, that is qualified, 
ministers of the New Testament. Grace qualifies you, not law, of the New Testament, New Covenant. Not of the letter law, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. In 1 Corinthians, we saw that the strength of sin is the law. Uh, in Romans chapter 7, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter. That's what we read in Romans. The word glory is the word doxa in the Greek. Uh, it literally means exercising personal opinion which determines value. It's like, what? here's a hairbrush of mine. I, 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 to me, it has greater value than other combs or brushes. You know, it's, it's what you consider something's value or worth to be. That's literally what the word means. It's, it's, it denotes you have a good opinion. It's something that has worth. And so as we read this, keep that in mind. Verse 7, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, if, in other words, if it had value, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Verse 8, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather more glorious? More glorious. Okay? It has more value. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. Verse 11, For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remained is glorious. So my question to you folks would be, just how much value or worth do you place on the New, new Covenant? The New Testament of grace as opposed to the old covenant of law. Because God's God, God says here that grace exceeds the glory of the old covenant, which was law. Okay? Dearly beloved, I read the heart of God in those verses beseeching us to make a proper personal estimation of the value of grace in your life. And I don't see a lot of Christians doing that. Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. The Greek says great boldness we use. The word is boldness, confidence. Uh, that's, a, that's a statement that's quoted with resolve. That's leaving a witness that something deserves to be remembered or taken seriously. And law, folks, does not instill that boldness or that confidence. It never has and never will. Verse 13, and not of Moses, which put a veil over his face, okay, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look. The Greek word there means gaze, focus your attention uh, to the end of that which is abolished. Think, think about it. Moses, he had, a, he had a personal encounter with the living God on Mount Sinai that left his face shining with what, what was obviously a, a correct, estimation of God's that glory, okay, or value, all right? And then as it faded, he sought to conceal that fact from the people, that, that that glory could no longer be maintained apart from him being in God's presence. And the same is true today. Whether we're speaking of the Israelites, whether we're speaking of Jew or Gentile, our focus is on Christ and what he's done. Folks, if your focus is on law and self, you're not focused on the greater glory. It's just that simple. 14 tells us their, their minds were blinded for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, uh, which veil is done away in Christ. Verse 15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. But folks, that's not the case with you and I. We now project an estimation of God's true worth and, and the New Testament's real value in a way that will never fade. In Christ, that veil is removed. When His people turn to the Lord, I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile, when, when His people turn to the Lord, that veil is removed. 
Both covenants, folks, were good. It's not that one was bad and one was good. Okay, here. The text makes it clear both were good. It's not that something good replaced something that was bad. It's that the, the good, what was good was replaced with something far better. And today, millions of Christians who want God's best for their lives are not focusing on, on that which is greater in value but lesser. <laughs> and that's just sad. This is what God wants us to know in, in a very real experiential way. If your focus is on law and self and the flesh and your own performance and your own works, you are not focused on the greater glory, folks. Verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Verse 17, now the, the Lord, the Spirit is, says the Greek, and where the Spirit of the Lord now is, there's liberty. The word liberty there denotes uh, freedom from slavery. 18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Beautiful, beautiful verse. That's what happens when our gaze, our focus is on Christ. We are changed. I mean, we're changed from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay? Until that day when we become fully and completely like Him. How? Well, by our seeing Him as He truly is. The God of all grace. Look. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.